working, but for some reason. Mm -hmm. All right, Today go ahead. It's 7.02 on September 8, 2021. I'd like to call the regular planning commission meeting uh, to order. Um, can somebody that is there in the office uh, do the flag salute, please? I don't have one here. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thanks, guys. All right, so just working down the agenda, it looks like we don't have any um, old business. So moving right into news business, looks like we have a um, appeal hearing tonight for the ZP21-031 UEC transmission line. I guess before I get going on the Barry, was there anything else we needed to go through tonight um, before I get going on the new business? Um, no, all we have on this is just the uh, to appeal hearings. Uh, the one thing I, I, I asked you earlier about was, um, I don't think we have a vice chair anymore. Should we do that election tonight? Because um, Adam Cole was the, the vice chair, wasn't that correct? Yes, it's not on the agenda, but if you want to call that, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think we should. Uh, I don't think we've had a meeting since Adam's resignation, or maybe we have, but we forgot to do the election. Um, so is there any uh, anybody willing to volunteer their name or anybody want to nominate anybody for the vice chair position of the planning commission? So it looks like, who do we have present? We've got um we got sam we got ragna jackie can we do a quick roll call real quick yes Okay. Sam Irons. Present. Jake. Right here. Carla Jimenez. Jennifer Layton. Jennifer, is that you? Yes, I'm here. Zach Reese. Present. Looks like the only one absent is Carla Jake. Okay. So I guess back to uh, the discussion or board discussion over a vice chair. Is there anybody that wants to nominate themselves or anybody else? Yeah, I'll nominate me. That was Ragna. I, I think that Ragna, did you say you, you self-nominated for vice chair? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? have any nominations or does somebody want to second Ragna's motion? Yeah, I'll second Ragna's motion for vice chair. Yeah, we have a, a motion presented by Ragna for um, vice chair position of the planning commission. We have a second from Zach. Um, all those in favor, I think Jackie, you better do a roll. I think do a roll call with everybody online. Sure. 
Sure. And I think what I'm going to do is defer uh, the roll call and the rest of the recording of the meeting over to our new city recorder, Jen Rollins. Sorry. Oh, nice to meet you. I'm sorry. I didn't, I didn't see you in there. I would have, uh, I guess, asked for introductions. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay, I'm happy to meet you guys. All right, well, I will go down. So, uh, Sam Irons. Hi. Uh, Ragnar Vanek. Um, um, abstain. Abstain. Oh, oh. Uh, John Furlighton. Yes. Zach Bracey. Yay. And Jacob King. Yay. Do we have a new vice chair? All right. So now we'll go ahead and move into the new business again. Um, again, we're looking at a public hearing tonight uh, for a, an appeal, ZP21-031 of the UC transmission line. Um, so at this, at this point, we'll go ahead and call this hearing to order. Again, this is a appeal uh, for a transmission um, application that was previously approved as a type two administrative decision by the city of Boardman. Um, so the appeal comes to the planning commission. Um, any abstentions? So if there is no other, it looks like we do have a quorum. Um, this is Jacob. I am going to abstain tonight based on the fact that this application does cover some property that is owned by uh, my employer. Um, so I have a potential conflict of interest. Uh, so I, I hate to put, uh, I guess Barry can fill us in on running the meeting. Um, but moving forward, I believe now we have a vice chair that Ragna should probably commence the hearing. Is that correct or am I incorrect, Barry? Well, the question, the, the question what the, um, do you have the decision making capabilities on that property? Let me try that again. Do you have decision making capabilities on the property that's owned by the court? Do I have decision making? Um, I would say to an extent, yes, um, especially with uh, the knowledge and the background of this project in particular. I did do all of the preliminary um, Port of Morrow. Um, review on the easement itself. Um, so I do think that my knowledge of the project causes a little bit more of a potential conflict of interest uh, on this one, so. And since we do have a quorum, even with me, with my absence, um, I feel a lot more comfortable um, with the abstention. Ragnar, are you ready to pick up the? I guess the, I haven't checked my elementary procedure for this, but sure, I guess we can make it through. Um, huh, okay, well. Um, well, yeah, okay, well, this is interesting. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, I guess I should have kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Um, yeah. You have a copy of the cheat sheet? No. It's, it was in the packet. How to conduct the public hearing. It's the second page in the packet. Well, it was, huh? The second page in the packet. Yeah, it was in that first email. Yeah, which I don't. Oh, I see. Conducting. Oh, okay. Yes, the one with the red red writing. Got it. Um, purpose of the hearing is to review appeal 
for ZP21 through Z031 UEC transmission line. Um, we called already, called for the abstentions, right? And um, that was Zach is abstaining from the discussion this evening. Uh, Jacob Kane is. Jacob, oh, sorry. Jacob Kane. <clears throat> Any other abstentions? Hearing none, then it's just um, Mr. Kane. Objections to jurisdiction. Are there any objections to the jurisdiction of the com Planning Commission of the City of Boardman to hear the matter? Hearing none, we're moving forward. Um, staff report, staff recommendation. So I think that's you, Barry. Excuse me. Uh, the notice of decision uh, was made on July 26, 2021. Uh, we received on May 19, 2021, uh, UEC submitted an application for zoning approval for the Olson Road transmission project, a 230 kV electrical transmission line in the service center subdistrict. This project affects tax lots 402, number 403, number 405, 4N25 East 11, and tax lot 3201, 3202, and 3205 of Morrow County tax map 4N25 E10, which were withdrawn by UEC from this project. Uh, this was uh, done as a type two decision, approval of an outright allowable use, um, consistent with chapter 4.1 of applications and review. The type two decision process requires public notice to be sent, properties within 250 feet of the parent property and post notice on the local reader boards and on the property. Public notice was mailed and the proper posting was was accomplished on October 1st of 2000, 2020. Uh, and then we'll go into the findings of fact that I had at the time. Uh, in 2018, Yuma Electric Co-op approached the city about the construction of a 230 kV line, transmission line from a substation which was being built I-84 and U.S. 730 Junction to South Boardman. This transition line is to provide increasing service, for, increasing service for, from service pressure existing and projected growth at residential growth. The city informed UEC where the line would go through many of the lots in the service center subject district. Some evidence of the property owner support would be needed. UEC held no, numerous meetings with the city, county, and county staff members, and potentially affected property or property owners about the project. UEC had obtained tentative agreements for most of the property owners for the easement for the line. The Tom and Paul family had not reached an agreement with UEC. At this point, UEC petitioned the Oregon Public Utilities Commission, the PUC, for a certificate of public convenience and necessity. Number six, PUC began their review of the petition as PCN4. Number seven, on March 5th, 2021, the PUC or by order 21074 rendered their decision to grant UEC a CPCN for the 230 kV transmission line. On April 15th, uh, Umatilla Electric submitted a conditional use permit application for the construction of the transmission line. After review of the application, it was determined a conditional use permit was not necessary as, as the application for the transmission line was an outright allowable use under the provisions of uh, Boardman Development Code, subsection table 2.2.200B sub 2 sub B. 
On May 19th, the city received another application for zoning approval, which is the type two uh, administrative decision process. With the June 20, with the June 21st planning commission docket full requiring staff at the time, UEC was informed the decision would be in July. Um, the proposed transmission line will be required required to meet the standards, specifications, and provisions of the National Electric Safety Code, which is the applicable, applicable code for this type of project. As staff reviewed the application, the language of subsection table 2.2.200 B sub 2 sub B brought the question is a electric um, is an electrical co-op, which is user owned a private utility. City Attorney David Blanc received this, and UEC is a corporation uh, incorporated OR in, by ORS Chapter 62, qualifying UEC as a private utility. One comment repeatedly heard from First John 217 2, LLC is that it violates the city's underground wire. Wiring Control District, Urban Municipal Code, Chapter 13.12. There are two key provisions which negate the comment. Chapter 13.12, subsection 13.12.130, sub E. Peter line state that a line that serves the system but no specific customer placed underground by the council or un, under Count by council order shall be put underground at the expense of the city by crediting cr franchise fees in the amount of the actual cost dis differential between overhead and underground installation. This cost differential for uh, 230 kV line are 10 to 15 times the cost, and the UEC's total franchise fee could not pay the difference in cost over the lifetime of the underground installation. The other key provision is uh, variance is allowed by the code in 13.12.140 sub B sub 2 it is economically not feasible. 15. On July 14, 2021, the city received a letter from Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group representing 1st John 217 LLC stating the city should not it should not have accepted the application because the Tomlins have full ownership of lots, tax lots 3302 and 3305 of Morrill County Tax Map for North 25 East 10. And there is no signed agreement with UEC. With UEC. Uh, on July 16, on July 20, 2021, an email was received from Tommy Brooks. Brooks of Cable Houston LLC representing the Mattel Electric Corporation cooperation uh, informing the city of uh, UEC's withdrawal of tax lots 32, 3302 and 3305 of Morrill County tax map for N25E10 from the application. On July 17th of 2020, or July 21 of 2021, a letter from Fred Wilson, Kellington Law Group, representing First John LLC, reiterating the Tallman's ownership of the tax lot, tax lots, and the fact that no agreement between the Tallman's and UAC have been concluded. 18 on July 21st, 2021, a letter from Fred Wilson. As a repeat, 19 on July 21, 2021, a letter from Kelly Doherty in opposition to ZP 21 031, citing it was in a, it was not in accordance with the underground wiring municipal code 13.12. Additionally, citizens have the right to a public hearing on this decision. Upon the withdrawal of tax lots 3302 and 3305 owned by the Thomas, the city has five other property owners affected by this decision. 
of which all five signed have signed agreements with UEC for this project. Laporta Morrow, Double T Farming, Effie and Francis Glenn, Randall and Catherine Yates, and Wallow uh, LLC. Uh, the city is also currently working to complete the alternate access road, uh, meeting the Porto Moro interchange area uh, access management plan. And that was in the notice of the decision. Uh, there are additional, after the appeal was, was filed, I've got a set of uh, findings of fact that have added about nine additional things as a result of what was in the appeals package. Oh. The city was informed UEC where the line would go through many lots in the service center sub-district. The support of the property owners was, would be necessary. And no prop number three, no property in the service set, center subdistrict are located in the BPA transmission easement subdistrict, which has been as has been claimed. UEC holds numerous and have numerous meetings and we've gone through that. Okay, on July 14, 2021, the city received a letter from Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group representing First John 217 LLC, stating the city should not have accepted the application because the commons have full ownership of tax lots 3302 and 3305, and there is no signed agreement. Mr. Wilson's letters and Ms. Lori B's letter and upon withdrawal of tax lot 3202. Um, the city is currently working to create, uh, complete the alternate access road meeting the Port of Morrow Interchange Access Management Plan. Premier Excavating is the contractor which will be starting work in early October. The roadway is part of the Port of Morrow Interchange Area Management Plan, which was approved by the City of Boardman, Port of Morrow, Morrow County, and the Oregon Department of Transportation in 2011. On August 25th, 2021, the City of Boardman obtained agreements from Effie and Francis Glenn and Rich Devlin, Devin for the rights of way for the alternate access road. And for the rights, yeah, for the alternate access on the east side of Laurel Lane to, to meet the, the location agreed upon in uh, Port of Morrow Interchange Area Management Plan. On August 13, 2021, public notice of the appeal was mailed, property owners posted on the property. And on August 14, public notice was published in the East Oregonian for a type three decision hearing of the Boardman Planning Commission. In addition to the roadway, sanitary sewer is being installed to service the properties to eat the east side of Laurel Lane on the existing Yates Lane. The plan to provide sewer and roadways on the west side of Laurel Lane will not occur at this time as the negotiations with the Tallman family have not proven successful in, new, in numerous opportunities. On September 1st, 2021, uh, we received an email from Cheryl Tallman stating this application does not meet Chapter 3.4 of the Board of Development Code. Uh, 29 on September 1, 2021, testimony was received via email from Kelly Dory claiming the process errors among several reasons, uh, among several reasons not to approve this application. On September First, 2021, Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group, representing John 2017, first John 2017 LLC, submitted a letter via email 
and nine exhibits to add to the record. So, because it, I believed it was a type two decision, uh, the appeal was made. Planning Commission uh, has basically two different roads that can go down. One being uh, that they deny the appeal, which it will most likely end up being appealed further to the city council, or it, it can be remanded back to staff to start the process over again. Are there any questions? Um, any questions? I got to figure out how this, um, how we do this on Zoom. I'm sorry. Anybody have any questions? The planning commission have any questions? Yes. Samples. <laughs> yes. Um, you're recognized. Did I unmute myself? Yes. What's your inquiry or your question? What am I doing wrong here? Can he not hear me? Frank, no, we didn't hear you. It sounded like Sam had something to say. Sorry, I, I do not have any questions. Oh, oh, okay. I have to so, apologize. I'm on vacation on my cell phone, so. Okay. Um, so I don't, none of the other um, commissioners seem to have any questions. Okay. Um, hearing none, um, proponent's case, I guess, is where we are moving on to. Anybody want to speak for the proponents? I have a question. Is the proponent in this case the, the appellant? Or is the proponent the applicant? It's That's a good question. I would think, hmm? go ahead. Was it Barry talking? They're proposing the appeal. So they would be the proponent, the, the, the attorneys would be the proponent. Yes, because they want to appeal the decision. Right. Okay, so that'd be um, Kelly that Answer your question. Who was that? That that was me, Tommy Brooks oh, for okay. Human Cell Electrics. That that does answer my question. Thank you. Okay. Did did you have anything? So I do when you okay. when it's appropriate for the appellant to speak. Is that now? Sure. Okay. You're the proponent? I am. Okay. Thank you. My name is Wendy Killington. I am an attorney with the Killington Law Group. I represent First John 217 LLC and Jonathan Tallman. And I have a question. The reading of the agenda suggested there was only one appeal hearing today. My understanding is there are two. Will they be taken up at two different times or are we combining them into one? We have it on the agenda as two separate. Um, okay. So that's how we've been proceeding. Or at least okay. that's how I read it. And um, commissioners, is does anyone want to propose that we deal with them together, it would seem as though um, keeping this separate would make the most sense at this point, since we our got, documents, go ahead, what, Barry? Correct, yeah. we got notices that went out. It's, it's two separate processes that have to be gone through. Okay. We just we'll both of them on the same night. Yeah, so we'll be keeping them separate. Okay. 
And then if I understand the way the hearing will move forward, the appellant will go first, the applicant will have an opportunity to respond, and then the appellant will have the right of rebuttal. Am I correct in that? That's that correct. is what that I is am correct. used to. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. So we're talking about the UEC application then, and I've told you who I represent, and I believe that Jonathan Tallman will also want to speak when I am finished. So what I want to talk with you about is the reason why you should deny the application. You should not send it back to staff. The last time Morrill County tried to play nice with UEC and did things like that, UEC promptly filed a writ of mandamus against them and forced approval because the application had not been decided within a requisite time period of 150 days, I believe in that situation. And I think that the city should not put itself in that situation. And so consequently here, the planning commission should simply deny. It's appropriate to deny and we'll explain why. The other thing before I get going that I do want to clarify is that this is the initial evidentiary hearing under a particular set of statutes to include 227.175, subsection 10, small a, d through e. This is a de novo hearing. It means that it is not limited in any way and it must be conducted pursuant to ORS 197-763. The reason why you ought to deny the application is many and varied. Some are really important for your city, and so I hope you listen. The use that's been applied for is a high voltage transmission line in towers, and that is not a use that is allowed in the zoning district. First of all, it is impossible for the proposal to be a transmission line because it fundamentally is missing any ability to convey electricity. And that's because the applicant UEC withdrew part of its application on property it didn't own that it had no right to submit an application for in the first place because it lacked the consent of the owner, the Tallmans. And when it did that, it created a large gap in the ability of the transmission line to do anything other than look really ugly within the city. Moreover, approval of the high voltage transmission towers and lines isn't allowed in the commercial service zone. If you look carefully at the way the city's code is structured, if you look at the zone in 2.2.200B, it refers to private utilities are allowed. And then a separate zoning district, the BPA subdistrict, allows high voltage transmission lines to be sited strictly within that area. What is the point of the BPA corridor if high voltage transmission lines and towers are allowed everywhere? There would be no point to it. And contrary, uh, contrary to the BPA subdistrict, uh, and other provisions in the city's code, the decision violates the Boardman Code 13.12.030, which expressly prohibits overhead wires. And that's a really important code section that uh, Mr. Byler indicated he believed did not apply, but he's provided no reason why it would not apply. The only, that's, that was a code provision that your city council adopted as sort of an environmental justice to protect your city. And your city council said, we're looking awful juicy and awful pretty for Los Angeles and Phoenix and San Francisco and Portland. And we don't want to be the high voltage corridor for all of those places. We want to be a livable, beautiful city. So we're gonna be a team player. We're gonna take one for the team. And we're gonna create this really big BPA corridor that's beefy enough for those guys to get what they want. But we're also going to establish this policy that says thou shalt have no overhead power lines outside of that area. And why is that? Because they look terrible and they can be dangerous. That's why the BPA subdistrict has all of those protections. They have setbacks and all kinds of things like that. None of that is provided 
in the service commercial zone. And, you know, yeah, probably UEC is a private utility, but it is not the kind of private utility that the city allows in the service commercial district, because if that's the way you look at it, you are setting a precedent here. Make no mistake, you are playing with a very big corporate entity. UEC is a very big corporate entity. And as soon as you tell them, we interpret your high voltage towers and transmission lines to be private utilities in the nature of a cable line or a telephone line, there will be nothing to stop them. Because if they're permitted here, the way your code is written, ask your city attorney, ask your planning director, it's the same thing in every zone. So they're gonna be knocking at your door in every zone and say, you did it there, you gotta do it here. We are permitted outright and watch us go and they will go. So this is your chance, a really important chance to protect your city, which has gone to the trouble of creating an underground wiring control district that forbids overhead wires except in that BPA corridor without a variance. There is no application here for a variance. There is no evidence here that a variance could be granted. Nobody has put any evidence in the record about the economics of undergrounding or why it is that UEC can't kind of go somewhere else, why it has to take the city to put in this yet another high voltage corridor that adversely affects the livability of your city. It's ultra virus to grant a variance without ever having an application, any findings, any evidence regarding uh, meeting any approval standards. And I submit to you that if a variance were submitted, that it could not be met. So the proposal is ultra virus in your city. So, um, I also want to talk to you about um, to the extent that the decision is purporting to approve an alternate access road, that too is way beyond the city's authority. There's no application for a road. There's no application signed by the property owners. This is the same problem that UEC had when it filed an application for prop to put a big transmission tower in line on the Tallman family's property, property it didn't own. Well, now the city's fixing on approving a road for itself over property that belongs to the Tallmans. And the Tallmans are nice people. They're, they're good people. They've been in the city a really long time. And they've been squeaking like little mice saying, will you please listen to us? Will you please work with us? Will you please talk to us? And the city doesn't want to do that. They just say, we're going to have a road. We're going to have a high, high transmission line and really ugly towers, just crisscrossing your property, just ruining it, just ruining it. And we're going to have a road without your consent over your property. And we're not going to sign an application that says that we have your consent, which is totally prohibited by the city's code. And that's just not okay. Thank goodness there's a law because the law says you guys don't have the authority to consider an application for a road that goes over property that doesn't belong to the applicant. Number one, there isn't even an application here. There's no location, no design. There's nothing like that in the record. No standards have been identified. The road is actually inconsistent with the 2011 Port of Morrow IAMP, which is a part of the city of Boardman's comprehensive plan. There's a particular alignment that is shown in the IAMP for this, this road, if it ever happens in the future, and if it ever meets approval standards. And it's not where it's proposed here. There are provisions in the IAMP that contemplate that the road will be built to collector standards, which are standards in the city's TSP, Transportation System Plan, and in the city's own zoning code that talk about, here's how we put roads in and we make them look nice and functional for our city. Collector roads are supposed to have sidewalks. They're supposed to have uh, street lights. They're supposed to have landscaping and bike lanes and all of that stuff. And here you have evidence in the record that the city plans nothing more than just to pave it. And 
you heard in the staff report, something which I hadn't heard before, that whereas the city's gonna put in some sewer for the people on the east side who've done what the city and UEC have asked, because the city hasn't gotten what it wanted, the Tallman's property, it's not gonna put in a sewer as a part of that road uh, as it affects the Tallman's property to the west. That's called unlawful retaliation for the Tallman's exercising their first amendment rights to say, will you please listen to us? The city can't do that. That's a constitutional problem. The city also can't do it because the city's code says, if you're gonna put in a road, you gotta put in water and sewer. We're ignoring all of that. And that's another reason why this thing needs to be denied. Um, and then there's the procedural errors. Uh, they are many and varied with this application, which has made it really hard for me and my staff to help the Tomlin family to, uh, to figure out you know, what standards apply, how to, how to deal with the standards that apply when you know, none of them have been listed. Uh, the, the initial notice didn't say the place or the time or the date when comments were, were due. It didn't have any of the ORS 197-763 requirements. And then the decision doesn't comply with the code or state law, it doesn't address the approval standards. It didn't provide mailed notice. It doesn't require all of the, the required elements and, and, and standards. And the reason that matters, it, this isn't just make work. It matters so that people like the Tolman family don't have to hire the likes of me and my staff that they can actually figure out how they talk to you about having the city comply with the standards in the city's own code and you know, kind of protect them. And so I hope that you will find it in your heart to deny this proposal that meets pretty much nothing. It's not an allowed use in the zone. It's something the city expressly prohibits without a variance. There's no application for a variance anywhere in sight. There's no evidence one could even be granted if one were requested at some point with a proper application. The process hasn't been right. None of it's right. I think it would make a lot of sense if I were on the planning commission to say, city, why don't you talk to the Tallmans? Why don't you see if you can figure out a way for you to get something that you need and UEC to get something that it needs and the Tallmans to get what they need in a way that doesn't hurt our city, but it's kind of good for everyone. Because when I went to kindergarten, that's what we did. And I hope that you will agree with that. I reserve the opportunity rebuttal that you said that I had, and thank you. Jonathan is next, unless you have questions of me. Um, commissioners, do you, does anybody have any questions? No. Not at this time? Okay. Not right now, no. Thank you for your time. Okay, so I guess if Jonathan's ready, uh, yes, this is uh, Jonathan Tolman. First of all, thank you for your guys' time. I do appreciate it. Um, yes, everything that my lawyer just said, I 100% I, uh, believe. Uh, two years ago, I, tr I tried to, um, to go to the city and say, hey, let's work together. I still say, hey, let's find a way that works together. Um, I, I have some proposals out there that I've uh, talked about that I want to work with. I, I still want to reach out um, to the lawyer at UEC and say, hey, let's find a way to make this work. And I've, I've tr gone over it with everything as far as the numbers and as far as um, uh, what needs to happen with it. And as far as our you know value that we need to get for our property, I really want to work with the city and with you, Matilda Electric. The, um, about a year ago, the city said that they didn't uh, that this was between UEC and us. And if this is just between us and UEC, then I ask that they just deny this application and have UEC work with us directly before they uh, approve any of this, this zoning, before it gets done. I welcome the chance and the opportunity to work with everybody involved to get this done. Please, let's let's stop this and work together to find a way that, that everybody gets the value out of this so that it's a win-win opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Tallman. Um... Any questions of Mr. Tallman? 
Um, anybody no. else to speak on behalf of the proponents? I would like to, Kelly Doherty. Okay, Ms. Doherty. Hi, this is Kelly Doherty. I actually live in the county, but I have a business proposition for the city and I too am in fear of overhead lines going over probably a piece of property that I had designs to build businesses on. And for those reasons, I um, stepped in and um, would like to put my two cents in. I think I listed, I don't know, 20 or 30 procedural errors. Some of them I believe are um, substantial, some of them you know, um, may get you caught up in a civil lawsuit. Um, I believe that we started out the application with 13 tax lots on the application on July 1st. Are you still there? On July 1st, um, there was a published notice with a lot number 405, 3211, 3100 were noticed, but not on the application. Later, two were removed in the application. The decision notice notes four tax lots in the decision, but the notice of appeal references eight tax lots after the Tallmans have been removed. The procedural errors are numerous. They violate 197, 763. Um, they violate um, your development code. They violate everything. <laughs> Basically, you can't hardly find a notice that was done correctly. Um, I also believe that in the application, there are tax lots that are in the general industrial um, zone, which haven't been noted as any criteria for them on 227, 173. I believe you have to note that it, the criteria for the GI zone as well. Um, which they do not do. Um, and I looked up the definition on the ORS is of a, what a public utility is, the definition of it. I believe that the city council had thought that perhaps they were a private utility, but I think you'll find in my notes that the definition of a, a public utility uh, 757.005 will provide you the reasoning that you can find that this is not a private utility, it is a public utility. Um, therefore, it fails to comply with the uh, standards and the, the development code 2.3110A and 2.22100B in the service district. I would actually like to have added to the um, this appeal from the city the affidavit of notice for the administration land use decision, the notice of the decision and the notice of the appeal. If that could be added to the record and um, some time to go over that after we get it, since we really can't figure out what tax lots um, were noted, <laughs> which ones were noticed. And I believe that probably some people got left out in that process and I believe that process um, to be very important um, for the citizens of, of Boardman. Um, I, let's see. I think I'm going to end that right there. I, I, okay. you know, I think you can read through my, my notes, you know, um, as far as that goes and thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you. We, um, yes, uh, it was included in our packet and um, I, I, as I'm sure the commissioners did as well. Um, um, you asked if we could include some other, what did you want us to include? Can we do that, Barry? The other evidentiary documents you wanted to include? Yes, that, that's all part of what we're doing with the hearing. Okay, so we will do that. Um, okay, any um, commissioners? Do any other commissioners have any questions at this time? 
I do. Okay. Uh, Miss Doherty, are you, can you just clarify, are you currently a property owner in that, in that area? No, not currently. Okay, just a potential uh, business or a potential owner? Yes. Okay. I expressed um, my, you know, we're, we're, we're in beginnings of a, of a process and um, getting this dealt with, but before I do anything further, I want to see the outcome of this to see where those transmission lines are going to go and where they're going to go next. Got you. Thank you. Okay, so no further um, discussion from the uh, from the proponents. So I guess we're moving on to the opponents' case. Uh, good evening. This is Tommy Brooks. Uh, I'm an attorney at Cable Houston, and I'm representing Umato Electric Cooperative here. Um, so I'll be presenting for us, uh, and it'll just be me tonight. Um, I think before I get started on some of the points I wanted to make, I'm going to hit on a few responses um, just to issues raised by Ms. Kellington and Ms. Doherty, because um, I think they a little bit in the vein of st static that we can work through that aren't really relevant to the, the issue that's actually in front of you. And I'm gonna start off with the access road that Ms. Kellington spoke about. I'm picking that first because I really don't know how to respond. That's not part of our application. UEC does, doesn't build roads. We, we build transmission lines and, and other electric distribution facilities. Um, I'm not aware of any part of our proposal that is intended to approve a road. Um, and I'm, frankly, I object to any mention of that in this proceeding because it's not anything that we're doing. So um, all of that information, I, I think you can disregard. It's wholly irrelevant to this. Um, I also, it, interesting in the written materials and tonight I've heard both things from um, the appellant side of this, one that we are a private utility and one that we're a public utility. Um, so I, I think you need to understand what UEC actually is. It is a private utility. It's an electric cooperative. Um, the reference that Ms. Doherty gave to ORS 757-005 speaks to public utilities. That's the PUC statute. Uh, UEC is not regulated by the PUC. And if you go one more statute down to 757-006, um, it actually says, for purposes of the statute, public utilities do not include uh, electric cooperatives. So I, I don't think there's any dispute on our end that we are a private utility. Um, and we've proceeded in that vein. Um, and I don't want you to think there's a, an issue to be resolved there be, because there's not. Um, and then the, the, the last thing before I get to some bigger remarks is the, this whole idea of undergrounding and whether or not that's actually required. There's, there's two parts of the city's code I wanna point you to. Um, there's, the first part is the, the undergrounding district that Ms. Kellington referred to, and that's in 13.12.030. Um, it doesn't prohibit all overhead lines. It, says that most lines have to be undergrounded, but there is an express exception for feeder lines. And the code says that a feeder line is part of the, the system that's not, doesn't serve just one customer. That's what a transmission line is. This line goes from substation to substation. It's part of the system of the whole area. Um, we actually uh, went to great length at the PUC when we got our certificate of need for this line approved to demonstrate the role that this line plays in the whole system, that it's it's serving a, gr a growing load all throughout the Boardman area and the, the Port of Morrow area. Um, it's, it's a feeder line and it's not subject to that provision. Uh, so we don't need a variance. It's, it's, it's not part of the, part of the code. Uh, the other part of your code I wanna point you to is in 3.4.500, which is back in the land use section. And this is sort of, the development standards that has to do with public uh, facilities. 
And that section, three, four, 500, uh, addresses utilities specifically. And it's a similar provision that requires utility lines to be underground, but it expressly says, except high capacity electric lines operating at 50,000 volts or, or above. That's what this is. This is a 230 kV line. Um, so we, uh, there's, there's simply no requirement either under the municipal code or the development code to put a line like this underground. There was talk about safety. I mean, that's actually one of the reasons you keep uh, transmission lines above ground is for safety. It's horribly expensive. Um, and especially in, an, in a more urban setting, um, more dangerous to, to, to do that without a lot of investment. Um, and so this really is the, um, the, the safe way to construct this line. If there's any question you have about the safety of this line, that again was one of the issues that the PUC um, looked at when we got our certificate of need, um, that there are safety reasons to build this line. And that's a, a direct finding that that state commission um, made. So uh, I just, those are things that I think are around the edges of the actual land use code that's being applied here. Um, and like I said, are irrelevant and some frankly wrong. And I wanted to clear that up before we continue to move on. Um, one of the other things I wanted to sort of talk about is this is not your sort of normal permitting process. I mean, a lot of what you hear is about how you, what you should do or how you should interpret this because this is how things should be. Um, that's not our task. When we're in a situation like this, we're looking at what the law actually says. And um, the, the city council has already determined legislatively that this is the kind of use that's allowed in these zones. So um, trying to uh, do a, an end run around that determination uh, by trying to, you know, telling the planning commission that you have a chance to change the course of the future. It's just a, it's a, um, it's a, I don't know, a wrinkling of how the law should really be applied here. And what we're encouraging you to do is apply the code that exists. Um, it's also because it's an allowed use. It, you know, we applied for this zoning permit at the request of the city, but um, really there is no zoning permit criteria in the city's code. It's intended to be an acknowledgement of what's already allowed um, so that other permits like a building permit can be applied for. Um, you know, if there are other development permits, the city just wants to know that yes, you indeed are doing this um, allowed by right use. Uh, I think that's important because a lot of the procedural errors that have been raised here are about uh, not following the right statutory process but all those processes are about permits. And really under the statutory definition, this qualifies as what's called a, a zoning validation um, because it's not, you aren't being asked to approve the use, you're just being asked to acknowledge that the use that we've already been approved through by the code um, is, is what we say it is. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a fine distinction, but it's an important one because all of these arguments about what the statute says is required um, I think are, are not relevant to this proceeding. Um, that being said, the, the city's own code does appear to um, have sort of a, this type two process. And so what we're doing is, is following, following that process. Um, the, the last point I wanna leave you with before some procedural stuff is that, you know, this is a line that's been in the planning for a long time. It's received a lot of scrutiny it's received scrutiny by the state. Um, the Tallmans were, were there um, arguing against it there. It received scrutiny by the county. Uh, Tallmans were there. They're pretty much the, the only ones there um, asking the county to look at it closer. And, and the county looked at it. And although we did end up needing to go to the court to get a final decision, that was after the, the staff had approved it after the planning commission had approved it and time was just running low. So, so we went to the court and that was our right to do. And it's, uh, it's um, I, I don't know, I guess appreciate that being thrown out as something that is a threat to you guys because that's not what we're doing. Uh, we're trying to get this thing built and built timely because it is needed and it's needed by, by all of our customers. Um, and so that's where I want to end with uh, tonight, which is you know, a lot of this information I think uh, still needs to be digested both by, by staff and by us. Um, the 
city's code does allow for an extension of the record here. Um, and we'd like to ask for an extension of the record. Um, I think Ms. Kellington will be familiar with the 777 idea where we would leave the record open for seven days um, for, for new evidence. This would only be written, no, no need for more oral testimony. Um, the record would be left open for seven days after that um, to allow people to rebut if new evidence is submitted to the record. And then uh, as is our right, we'd have seven days as the applicant to submit a final legal argument. And we would like the, the, the planning commission to really be able to look at all of that, you know, what Ms. Kellington provides, what we provide and, and make a decision on those instead of, um, instead of just this hearing. Um, the, I think the 120 dead, day deadline is coming up. We're more than happy to waive that deadline um, for the amount of time it takes to, um, to extend the record for that period. Uh, so uh, if, and if you need something in writing to do that, we're, we're happy to do that as, as well. So um, with that, um, unless other procedural issues come up, I think I can conclude my remarks. Um, thank you. Is there anybody else for, um, oh, commissioners, anybody have any questions at this time? No. There, there is. This is Jonathan. There is one more thing I'd like to add after after listening to the UEC attorney there. Um, uh, Jonathan, then, we'll do that, John, we, Mr. Tallman. We'll do that um, in the rebuttal portion. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, I have no further questions. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Okay. We were. Oh, so anybody else want to um, address the um, for the opponents? Hearing no one, uh, we'll move on to the rebuttal. All right, so Wendy Killington again, and then it sounds like Jonathan may have a few comments. So I agree that the record should be left open for the 777 thing, and that we would, the the Tallman side of the house would ask to be allowed to participate in that. I think that's what Mr. Brooks contemplates, but I wanna make sure that that is clear. There were some things said that I think I would like to respond to in writing. So you've heard some, if you listened carefully to what UEC's lawyer told you, he said some things that were inconsistent and that's telling. So he said, well, we're a private utility, we're not a public utility because we don't go to the PUC. We're not regulated by the PUC. But then he went on to tell you that the PUC has vetted the project and issued a certificate of convenience and necessity. Those aren't the same thing. So if the only reason that they would not be a private utility or would not be a public utility is because they do not go to the PUC, but in fact they go to the PUC, then I think that the, the comments that you heard about the definition that describes a public utility applying to the UEC is, is valid. And Mr. Brooks also indicated that he thought that the, the appellants had not been entirely consistent about their view about whether the UEC was a public or a private utility. The answer is nobody, not us, and I don't think really anybody seriously thinks that UEC is a private utility within the meaning of the city's code that allows private utilities like cable and and electricity that goes to your house as a use permitted outright. And the moment you take the position it is, is the moment that you condemn your city to be the breeding ground for all manner of high voltage towers, lines and towers, because you will get this argument, well, we're permitted outright. We're just like a cable line. Well, you're not, you're not. There's a significant distinction. The way the city's code is structured and as your lawyer will tell you, the way you interpret the city's code 
is you look at the words that are used, you look at the purpose, the policy, and the context. And what is the context? The city's context for the thing that says little private utilities are allowed as use is permitted outright pretty much everywhere in the city is informed by a context that says, and those big boys, those go in the BPA subdistrict. And we as a city have made a, an extraordinary decision. It is the only one in all of Oregon, at least as far as I know, that has called itself an underground, uh, underground wiring control district because it matters so much to us to protect our little, little city's livability. And those guys are gunning for us because for whatever reason, we're right in the way of electricity that needs to get to, you know, to Portland and, and Los Angeles, that we want these things to be undergrounded unless a variance is granted. And we wanna do it with our eyes wide open. We want those guys to come to us and to file an application for a variance and prove to us there's really no option because we really don't like the idea of being those guys' as dumping grounds. So yeah, the right interpretation of your code is that UEC is not a private utility within the meaning of your code section. And you have the chance to interpret, you get to interpret your own code and this could go to the city council. And if the city council interprets its own code as doggone it, we mean what we're saying. Those big boys are limited to there. And if you want to, you know, come somewhere else in our city, you better ask us for a variance and we may or may not grant it. And if you don't, the wheels aren't off. It just means UEC has to go somewhere else because you did hear everybody else has approved it. Morrow County really didn't can't get a chance to make a final decision because, you know, the UEC filed litigation and got a court to order them to, to approve it. But you, you know, just because Morrow County was forced to let it happen, and just because PUC says, yeah, it looks good to us, we don't live there, doesn't mean that it's made it through the city process. And it hasn't. And you guys have the absolute right, absolute right to just say no. You may decide this is just cool. That, that may be how you interpret your code. But I'm thinking that you're gonna think this over really long and hard about whether this is really a precedent that you wanna set your city on a course to. I think you probably don't. And then you heard that the, this is a, a, feeder, is a feeder line. And so it's exempt from the city's thou shalt have no overhead wires except in the BPA subdistrict rule. Well, that isn't true. And here's why a feeder line is a line that conveys a system from point A to point B, you're not being asked to apply that, to approve that. You're being asked to approve little tiny pieces, whole big bunch of big old towers, but there won't even be any lines through part of it. Well, that means it can't convey anything anywhere. Now, it may be that if UEC can take over the, the Tommins property and take it away from that family that's had it for 30 years and it's part of their hopes and dreams. And it can, you know, just run over the top of them and, you know, get permission and then put in a whole feeder system over the Tallman's property. Well, you know, maybe they'd get within that exception then, but they can't get it now. And you shouldn't let them get away with saying, well, we're a feeder. They aren't. Why? because they don't have the right to run over the top of the Tallmans just yet. And I think you're gonna maybe think that they're, you're not gonna give them that right because once they run over the Tallmans, that stuff's coming straight for the rest of you. And it's gonna make a mess of your city. You know that as well as I do. So I don't think that this thing is permitted outright. And as we said in our, in our, in our appeal papers, this is defined as development in your code. None of those standards have been met. The fact that UEC doesn't like it, that the city is using the vehicle of their application to approve the, the west side of the loop road. I can't help it. I didn't do that, but that's, that seems to be in the decision. And I want you to know that something you ought to tell your city to do before they fix on putting that road in without land use approval is I would, I would commend their attention to a Luba case that came out in April 
of this year called Van Dyke versus Yamhill County. And in that case, Yamhill County thought it was a really good idea to start building a bridge before they got land use approval. They didn't have land use approval and the position they took that they didn't need land use permission was one that no reasonable lawyer would make and Luba awarded the successful attorneys who happened to be me $50,000 for having to go to the trouble of arguing about it. This road has the same sort of problem. There is no land use permission for it to the extent that the city is trying to use the, this particular approval process to get it. It won't happen and it can't be used for that. We've got that precedent. This is the city's moment to set a precedent that says, no, we are not going to allow high voltage transmission lines and monster towers in all of our zones on the idea that it is a private utility. This is our moment. What that, what that refers to are the little guys. Those are not referring to the, the huge 250, 500 KV lines, because the 500 will come later, you know it will. And I urge you to reject the proposal and I appreciate your time very much, thank you. Jonathan, do you have a thing? Uh, yes, I do. Um, when Umatory Electric says the, the loop road has nothing to do with the power line, the, 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 pow the loop road determines where the power pole goes and the power poles determine where the, the loop road goes. And so those are, inter those are interchangeable because they're stationary. They have to be plugged into the ground. And so one of the things that we've, we've reached out about is the city on our side can't do an eight inch line. We need water to all the property for what we want to use it for, for the highest and best use. And right now we need to make sure that the property has water. If the city does not give us an eight inch water line to our property, then we have to make sure that our well sustains us for um, future um, uh, uh, growth of what we want to do out there at the property. And so that power line goes directly over our, our well, so we have to redig the well. So it's it's a catch twenty two all the way around. Again, I and and what it boils down to is Umatilla Electric's offer is fifty six hundred dollars, and fifty six hundred dollars an acre is 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 an absolute joke. And 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 if if the, the city thinks that that is a decent offer, I will buy their land out there by loves for fifty six hundred dollars an acre. On that property, if that's if they think that's a decent offer for inside the city limits, and because that one's outside the city limits, I'm not here to not just give a uh, uh, oh my way or the highway. I want solutions that bring win-win uh, avenues to everybody involved, and I welcome for avenues to get that involved. And this does not do this the way th that the city uh, d designed it to do, as far as all the processes for. So again please look at the bigger picture of, of making this Boardman a, a, a great town. And I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Um, commissioners, do you have? Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello, this is Ed Glenn. I'm the applicant and I You're have a comment to make. You're a part. You're um, uh, a participant in the. You're just online, um, listening to things. Yes. In the audience. Okay. You have a. a I'm question. an applicant in both of these matters, and let me only say, this matter, these matters, have nothing to do with rules, regulations procedures only with money. Jonathan has made demands for outrageous expenditures of money. And so sir, are you, Kelly are you speaking, Wellington? Are you speaking for for either the proponent or the opponent? Proponent, yeah. I'm speaking as the applicant. Okay. Can I clarify that when he, I think when Mr. Glenn talks about the applicant, he's not talking about UEC. 
I'm talking about the landowner who has granted an easement to Umatilla Electric over a portion of my land. Oh. And I've granted a roadway across a portion of my property for a loop road on the east side of Laurel Lane. Oh, okay. I understand. Thank you for that. Now, let me tell you, there are no issues here of substance or procedure. The only issue is money. Tomans want an exorbitant amount of money, as does Welly, Kelly Wellington, whom I know from the past. Hello, Kelly. And that's all it is, is a matter of money. Okay, well, if, we appreciate your comments. Um, and if you, so. whatever you do, Imagine yourself spending a lot of the city's money defending your reaction. My suggestion to you is to remand both matters back to the planning department for a redo. Well, once again, okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for the proponents or the opponents? This is Kelly Gordy. I didn't get a chance to, to weigh in yet. Oh, I thought you had earlier. Okay. Yes, but not for the rebuttal. And I think you moved past without asking for anyone after Jonathan. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that. Go ahead. Um, I would like to say that that the lawyer for the UEC, Tommy Brooks, refers to the procedural errors as static, um, which I don't think that Luba necessarily finds procedural errors as static most of the time. Um, they are rights that civil law provides people to um, go through a procedure. And if the procedure isn't done right, then, you know, at, at more than appropriate times, um, the LUBA will remand these or deny them on procedural errors. So I don't believe that they are necessarily static. I don't believe that it's static when you send out notices that are not to the right landowners um, and landowners that haven't um, actually given an easement. I do believe in my in my statement that there is another landowner that the use easement isn't signed for, and that is the Double J Farming. Um, I believe that their easement ran out in 20 of 2020. Um, anyway, it's expired, never was updated to my knowledge, or at least it wasn't recorded at this at the county level or city level or any other level. Um, and so I, I just, you know, beg to differ that that these things are static. Um, for him, maybe they are, but for the city of Boardman, I don't think that's the case. Um, I still, I, I still can't even figure out which tax lots we're referring to after the 13 lots are on the application, and to the notice of the decision, we got down to four tax lots, and now we are back to eight tax lots. So, I think these procedural errors are substantial, um, and they they deny the rights of the citizens and and the landowners any. Um, right to comment on these things. So I think that, uh, you know, his, his view of what's static and, and criteria for these districts and our development code, you know, he finds static and I find it very important. Thank you. Thank you. And I, and I do apologize for um, moving on without giving you the appropriate time. My apologies and oversight. Um, Okay, so um, commissioners, any questions? 
of anybody? No. no? Not at this I time, no. Uh, I have a question. What, Barry? It appears that Ms. Kellington and, and Mr. Brooks uh, have opened a, another door for the extension, which is, correct me if I'm wrong, seven days for UEC to respond, seven days for uh, Kellington Law Group to respond, and what's the other seven? So that, that's not quite right, Barry. It's seven days for any participant to respond with evidence or argument to the things that have been submitted to date. The second seven is for rebuttal to information put in in the first period. And the last seven is for UEC to submit a final written argument, I think, as the applicant. That's correct. That's how uh, we intended it. Um, the only fine point that I would add to that is I think the, the record be open for the, the people that have standing, the participants here tonight for that first seven days. And both of you are agreeable to go through that process because that's, that's, that's another route that the planning commission can go. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, we, we would insist on it, but it sounds like we both agree on that process. So it sounds like the right way to go. So you would have the first seven days would be for the participants? Correct. The, the next seven is for? Uh, the next seven is for rebuttal. Um, so that would be for, it, to rebut what is already in the record. So no, you know, no yep. new evidence, new issues, but just rebuttal to what's already there, whether it's evidence or and argument. Nope. And the last seven is UEC to um, do basically a final. A, a final sentence. argument, yeah. right, without, without any new evidence uh, to be included in that, just strictly argument. And so a little clarification, though, and Tommy, you're going to agree with this, I know, is that second seven days is not to respond to anything in the record, only to information that comes in in the first seven days. Um, I think we would ask that it be for, um, to respond to, for any rebuttal, but I, I mean, I, I don't feel strongly about it either way. Cause we can do that in the initial, um, seven days. Let's do it that way. So the first seven is to any, any participant can say anything they want. The second one responds only to information in the first period. And the last is for your applicant, uh, final rebuttal or not rebuttal, final written argument, sorry. Sounds accurate. Okay. And I think if I, I may, that. Vice Chair, this is David Blanc, City Attorney. I just wanted to note for the record that under 4.1500 capital D3 small b that uh, based upon this uh, request of the applicant, the 120 day rule is waived. And I just want to confirm that from the record uh, if that's agreeable, Mr. Brooks. It, correct. Yes, we would agree to uh, extend the 120 day clock by the, the same amount of time. So this 21 days that would be tacked on to the end of the of the current clock. And if you need me to follow that up, Mr. Blanc in writing, I'm happy to do that. That would be great. I appreciate that. Yes. So you're extending the 120 days with the additional 21 days, huh? Correct. Which, what we're okay. Um, so commissioners, anything you wouldn't do with that, or do you want to, um, move to basically for the seven, 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 uh, somebody want to make a motion for that discussion. We need to discuss, is there discussion? Vice chair. You have to yes. close the you have to close the meeting before we deliberate. Oh, then we need to go down to public agencies. If there's yeah, any public agencies other than Morrill County. And are they here to talk tonight? They're not part of the appeal. Okay, so we don't have any of um, rebuttal evidence. I'm just no, using this sheet. 
if, if you guys want to make a decision on this 777, then basically what you have to do is close the hearing and then do your deliberations and motions. Right, but I have to finish this sheet before I close the hearing, don't I? The sheet, the, se the second sheet that was in the conducting a public hearing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all I'm doing, trying to, to um, finish that up and then close the hearing. So I guess we're good. Um, is there a motion to, no, I can just close the hearing, right? Do yes, I need a motion? Like I said, my parliamentary procedure is not what it once was. Um, okay, I, I closed the hearing, the hearing on, on the appeal hearing for on ZP21-031 UEC transmission line. Okay, that's closed. Um, okay, commissioners. Deliberate. Yeah, I, I, this is Zach. Uh, yeah. I, I think the additional 21 days, uh, it sounds like everyone's in agreement, sounds uh, pretty responsible of all parties. Um, I would like time to uh, digest all the information given tonight uh, and uh, look forward to hearing any, uh, any other submitted uh, arguments and, and uh, in that so I'm 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 good with that. Uh, um, anybody else? Anybody want to make a motion? So I guess this would be a motion to postpone the the decision. For the motion would be to uh, keep the record open. For the 21 days. Oh, right. right. Verifying that the first seven days is for the participants to provide new information. The next seven days is for, um, I have rebuttal, but then I can't read my notes. Um, rebuttal regarding the evidence that was submitted in the first seven days. And then UEC to have the uh, um, to make their final um, argument with on with no new evidence, and then to get the 120 days um, waived by U UEC. I think that's where we're going. Did that help? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. This is Zach. I'll I'll make a motion to keep the meeting open for the period of 21 days for the 777 uh, as agreed upon by parties in the meeting. I'd like to second that, Mrs. Carla. Okay, there's been a motion and a second with um, to keep the um, um, record open for uh, uh, for 21 days and to and um, for UEC to waive the. 120 days. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. You should do a, a roll call. Roll on call. That. Um, roll call on the the um, on the motion. I don't have everybody's name. I'm sorry. Um. Pardon me. Uh, oh, she'll do it. Uh, Sam Irons. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. And then uh, Carly Menace. Aye. Jennifer Lighton. Aye. Zach Gracie. Aye. Uh, Brandon tonight. Aye. Aye. Please come on. Jacob, are you going to abstain? 
All right, I was napping. I abstain. <laughs> Wake up. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. So, um, do we have to table that? Is that what we do with that? I believe that concludes that. Or just con item. continue. Oh, we don't continue. Do we need to set up a meeting in 21 days? Yes. Okay. Right. So it's a, is it a continuation? It's actually just leaving the record open and then you'll okay. have your hearing in 21 days. Oh, okay. So um, are we good then with our, that concludes the first, I'm sorry, I just didn't have all my paperwork set up for this. Did see the chat, by the way. Pardon me? Did everybody see the uh, Zoom chat? No. From Tamara with uh, County Planning? No. Okay, so it reads, Morrow County submitted written comments. Uh, in summary, if the application is approved, appeal denied. County requests city add conditions requiring an access permit and right-of-way permit where applicable. So that's being added to our, in our first seven days, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so where, so, so that's yeah. done. We're moving on to the second part, right? The second thing for this evening. Second, the second hearing. And yeah, and I can't I find. Hey, Ragna, this is Jacob. Yeah. Um, I think I can take back over now, if you would wish. That would be great. All right, moving on. Um, we've got a uh, oh, good job, Ragna. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> well, that's nice of you to say, but. <laughs> All right, so moving on, next item of the agenda, uh, another new business item. It's another uh, appeal hearing. Partition 5-2021, Glen Property Partition. Um, I don't know if I did a good job on the last one of going through and, and reading the purpose of the hearing. So the purpose of um, consideration of an appeal, the July 26, 2021 notice of decision of pipe two decision, the Board and Planning Commission. This appeal is for the request to partition a conforming tax lot, tax lot number 3201, of Morrow County Tax Map 4 North 25E Section 10 is a parent lot of this partition. The tax lot <clears throat> currently is a 7.61 acre parcel in a zone service center zone development code chapter 2.2. The request is to create accommodating a 60 foot right of way, a UEC easement option agreement and land within the Bonneville Power Administration easement. The hearing will be processed in accordance with the Boardman Development Code chapter 4.1.1. 500 type three procedure quasi judicial criterion. The appellant, those which have dis provided testimony written or verbally to establish standing on the issue may provide testimony until September 1st, 2021, any process for the hearing on tonight. So at this point in time, I'll go ahead and open that public hearing. Um, any abstentions? Any objections to the jurisdiction? Barry, can you take us to the staff report, please? Can, can you guys hear me or have I lost audio? I can hear you. I hear you. Okay. Um, City of Boardman, anybody in there can hear me? Screen looks frozen. 
So let's let's give them a minute. I think they're the host, so this might. Let's see what happens here. <clears throat> City of Borman, do you hear us? Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We can hear you now. We lost you there for a few minutes. Prop right off. I'm glad everybody's still here. So where okay. did you lose me? Do I need a setback or can we go right into the staff report? Uh, we're going to go right into the staff report. Perfect. Okay, on May 19th, 2021, the city received a zoning permit request and preliminary plat from F.E. and Francis Glenn for tax lot number 3200 of Morrill County Tax Map 4 North 2510, which is owned by the Glens. This tax lot is 7.61 acres in size. The purpose of the partition is to separate the lot into two parcels, parcel one being 3.591 acres and parcel two being 4.208 acres minus a 60 foot roadway dedication. Both lots would be in the service center subdistrict, which is a commercial zone. Approval of a preliminary plat it was processed using a type two administrative decision in accordance with Boardman Development Code Chapter 4.1 types of applications and reviews in Chapter 4.3 land divisions and lot line adjustments. The type two decision uh, process requires public notice to be sent to all property owners within 250 foot of the parent property and post posting notice on local reader boards and on the property and public notice was mailed to proper uh, and the proper posting was accomplished on October 1st, 2020, meeting the 20 day notification uh, criteria requirements. Uh, from the finding the facts on June 3rd, 2021, Frances Glenn delivered on behalf of herself and her husband to F.E. Glenn an application to partition tax lot 3201 of Morrill County Tax Map 4N 2510 into two parcels. Parcel one being 3.591 acres, parcel two being 4.208 acres with a dedication of 60 foot rights of way, which is 1.05 acres in size. The partition is subject to a type two administrative decision processed by the Boardman Development Code. Public notice was property was posted on the property and posted online at the city of Boardman website and was mailed to all adjoining properties and interested parties on July 1st of 2021. Public notice was mailed to Terry and Cheryl Tallman, which were the owners of record on the tax lot information the city had before, uh, prior to July 1st or one. Public number five, public notice was published in the East Oregonian on newspaper on July 3, 2021. The right of way dedication for the purpose of meeting the 2009 Port of Morrow Interchange Area Management Plan, which calls for al alternate access to the properties in the service center subdistrict zoning. Number seven, upon completion of this alternate, alternate access, the existing Yates Lane will become right in, right out only. Number eight, the property is zoned service center subdistrict, which is part of a commercial district. Number nine, although the BPA transmission line easement does cross the property, no part of the property is in the BPA transmission easement subdistrict. Number 10, a significant portion of parcel two is under the three Bonneville Power Administration transmission lines, one 500 kV line and two 230 kV lines. The BPA easement has set significant restrictions as to the allowance of activities and structures. Parcel two also contains a 100 foot wide strip of land, which has an uh, Umato Electric Co-op option agreement for a 235, a 230 kV transmission line. Parcel one would be outside the BPA and UEC and free of those restrictions. Number 13, on July 14th, the city received 
a letter from Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group on behalf of First John 217 LLC concerning Numatel Electric's application for the Olson Road 230 kV transmission line project. In this letter, the Glens property is also mentioned as prejudice to the Tomlin's substantial rights. On Wednesday, July 21, 2021, the city received a letter from Morrill County Planning Director Tamara Mabbitt in support of the Glen partition and roadway dedication. Uh, and on 14, no, 15, on August 5th, 2021, the city obtained agreements for the rights of way from FE and Francis Glenn and Rich Devon for the construction of a roadway to meet the locations consistent with the Ford Morrow Interchange Area Management Plan. Number 16, the roadway dedication is identified in and consistent with 2011 Port of Morrow IAOP, agreed upon by the city, county, Port of Morrow, and Oregon Department of Transportation. 17, on August 9th, Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group emailed paperwork to appeal the type to a de decision on uh, PAR 5 2021. Public notice of the appeal in FE of FE and Francis Glenn was mailed to the necessary property owners and interested parties, posted online at the city's website on August 13, 2021, posted on the property and was published in the East Oregonian on August 14, 2021. On September 1st of 2021, Cheryl Tolman submitted testimony via email claiming the application is in violation of Development Code Chapter 3.4 Public Utilities. And number 20 on September 1, 2021, Sarah Mitchell of Kellington Law Group representing uh, John 217, first John 217 LLC, submitted a letter uh, via email and nine, exe nine exhibit staff to the record. The notice of decision of the type two was uh, was uh, approved. So you have the same opportunities um, as what you had with the first hearing in terms of the uh, a, a, to den to deny the appeal would leave. Uh, would leave that standing as, as the approval and it would likely be a, a appealed again to the city council and if uh, or you can remand it back to the, to the staff and we can start the appeal process or the process for approval over again. So you have any questions? Barry, this is Jacob. I've got one question. Um, I, I was, it was a little bit fuzzy there. I didn't quite hear you, but did you say that the potential, um, this partition is consistent with the IMP? Um, plans from the, what was that the 2014 IMB document? 2011, 2011. 2011. And, and it's consistent with the general location. We, uh, we've already got a contractor and we've got drawings that, that uh, for trying to figure out where the towers are going and where to put the road and so on and so forth. So, and we've already let, let that contract. Okay. Any other questions for Barry from other commissioners? Not at this time, no. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, Barry. Uh, hearing none, we're going to move into the proponents case. Is there anybody here um, representing the um, proponents, which in this application would be um, 
the applicant to appeal um, or Yes. Thank you, Jacob. Wendy Kellington representing First John 217 LLC and Jonathan Tallman. And while we do not quarrel with the Greg's right to partition their property, that's not a problem for us or anyone else. What we do object to and why we have to ask for your denial is that again, the county used this decision as a vehicle to purport to approve the loop road and apparently as a vehicle to approve the UEC transmission line on this property. So remember in the proceeding that we just completed, we learned that there is a significant issue about whether in this zoning district that a high voltage transmission line and transmission towers are allowed in the zoning district. And for me to avoid boring you repeating everything I just got done saying, I would ask that the audio of the previous hearing be a part of that record. Is that a possibility, Jacob or Barry? This is Jacob. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> oh, come on. Barry, is that okay? Um, that, that would be acceptable. Okay, super. Okay. Because, yeah, uh, yeah. If, if this is purports to approve or purports to say that the transmission facility does not require the approval of the city or purports to approve it as it appears to be the case, it's not very clear to me and I'll bet it's not very clear to the planning commission, then the proposal should be denied or alternatively, if you were to approve the Glen partition, you should make clear that it doesn't also approve the high voltage power lines and transmission towers that the option apparently contemplates that that requires a separate process. The second thing is that the, this application for the poor Glenn family is being used by the city to approve this, this loop road. But the problem is that as before, this loop road is inconsistent with your 2011 IAMP that is a part of the city's comprehensive plan that covers this area, the IAMP says that the road is not to be in the BPA transmission easement. But if you look at the drawing papers in the record appended to the application, you will see that the proposed road is squarely there. A road in the BPA transmission easement requires a conditional use permit. There isn't any proposal here for a conditional use permit. There's no application for the road. There's no location or design in the record other than we see uh, where it's contemplated to be partly in the BPA easement. None of the standards that apply in the city's IEMP, which says the road's supposed to be a collector. Uh, nothing in the city's uh, code standards regarding the specifications for collector roads in, and roads that are supposed to be developed in the city to include a particular width bike lanes, street lights, sidewalks, planter, skip, slip, planter strips, landscaping, these sorts of things. None of those are proposed here. And of course the underground wiring control district has been completely ignored. And so to the extent that this application is doing more than simply approving a partition, then it is doing something that's ultra virus, is contrary to law, that requires all of the things that we've talked about for the transmission lines, you'd have to have a variance to the, the prohibition on overhead uh, lines. We've learned that there, this would not be considered a feeder because it doesn't transmit anything. It's got a significant gap over the Tallman's property and maybe other parts, we don't really know. 
It simply doesn't meet any of the required standards to be any more than a partition. And so for all of, all of those reasons, I think you have to deny or to the extent that you approve the, the partition proposal that you would make very clear that it doesn't A, approve a road for which there's no application and no standards are met and that's inconsistent with the IMP that's a part of your transportation or your comprehensive plan. And it doesn't approve a, a high voltage transmission line and tower either. It's nothing more than approving a partition for the Glenn family because anything more than that requires denial. And I would caution the city very, very much to just start constructing that road without getting land use approval. You really ought to read the Van Dyke versus Yamhill County final opinion and order uh, where Yamhill County decided to build a bridge without getting the required land use approval, say taking the position they could pretty much do what they wanted to do with their own property. And Luba said no, and again awarded attorney's fees because the position that you don't need any land use authority to build infrastructure like roads and bridges is so far off the beam that no reasonable lawyer would make the argument. So for all of those reasons, Again, to the extent that the partition is trying to be the little engine that could and do more than it's paid to do to approve a road that hasn't met approval standards and to approve transmission towers and lines that violate the city's code, it would be unlawful and inappropriate and we would request denial on that basis. Thank you. Jonathan, do you have anything else or is that good? Jonathan? Yeah, that was good. Sorry, I had you muted. That was good. Thank you. Okay. Are there Second. any other? We're done. Okay. Are there any other proponents? Do we have any questions from the commissioners for the proponents? No. No, sir. I, I've got a couple of questions. I'm not sure. I think this is the time to ask it. I guess I could wait till after the uh rebuttal um but i'll just ask it now why not um so a few questions on on this um application actually i'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and let rebuttal take first um sorry wendy um any rebuttal um to or any opponents to the application Can everybody hear me all right? I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure Ed understands this is his turn to talk. Let me see here. Ed Glenn, um, do you have anything you'd like to say about uh, the proposed, uh, the appeal on the application? This is the time to speak if you're an opponent to the appeal. Yes. I think again, it's a matter only of money. Jonathan wants the city and Umatilla Electric to spend a lot more money than they're willing to do. And that's the sum total of the problem. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Any questions from any commissioners for Ed? I'm okay, thank you. No. Okay, let me get back to my little cheat sheet here. <clears throat> so, um, Sarah, do you have any additional items um, for uh, cross-examination here? When do you mean? Yeah, that's what I meant. That one, okay, no problem. I'm so my no, name's I, mixed up. My screen's okay. only so big here. I know, I'm sorry. So, um, you know, Ed didn't really say anything that I need to respond to other than this, this is about complying with the city's code with, you know, applying and complying with the applicable land use standards. And I, 
I don't think that it's unreasonable for the Tallman family that have worked really hard for 30 years to establish what they have on their property to not want the city to take it away from them unfairly or cheaply because they don't view their life's work as cheap. And so I hope that doesn't interfere in, or enter into your decision. Thank you. Any questions from any commissioners? I'd like to respond to that remark. Tallman purchased that property from me more than 40 years ago. And they haven't worked any harder than I have to establish a place to live in Boardman. In fact, I was outside the city of Boardman where we originally lived. And it was to my sole effort that <coughs> this area, as well as a substantial part of the Ports Industrial Area, was annexed to the city of Boardman to its measure, is it to its substantial tax advantage. So to say, that the poor Tallman have worked so hard, while I have not, is missing the boat. Thank you very much. So that sort of slanderous statement, I guess I'm gonna ask for the 777. So I hereby request that I have the opportunity to respond on behalf of the Tallmans to those statements. Same 77 as before, it's just not fair, thank you. Okay, so your your request is to stop the statement there, is what your, your request is? My request is that the, the Planning Commission close the hearing, but leave the record open for us to provide a rebuttal in the next seven days. That's all I need. Okay, but... But you mentioned slander, so we can go ahead and go through with the rest of our hearing. Oh, and yeah. you're asking for yeah. an additional 21 days. Well, seven days. So I only need seven days. I just need to be able to respond on the Talmud's behalf for that. That, that feels really mean to me. And I'm sure they would like to clear their name. And so I just need a period of seven days after tonight's hearing for them to be able to respond. I don't need the second seven or the last seven. We don't need to delay it like that, but I would like the first seven. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from any commissioners? No, I've got sir. a couple questions. I've got a couple questions and this can be directed probably at Wendy um, and Barry can probably help in this. Um, I, I, I'm looking through here and I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything, but I'm looking through this application and this application looks to me like it is an application for a partition of an undefined piece of property on tax lot. Let me see here. Sorry, I'm trying to get the right document in front of me. Oh. Okay, here it is. So this is tax lot 3202, correct? And it's a 60 foot piece of strip on the east side of 202, is that correct, Barry? I guess, I guess where I'm going with it is I don't see how tonight's partition application has anything to do with the BPA easement or the line work that's not associated with the subdivision itself or the partition itself that is only pertaining to tax lot 3202. The 2.18 acre piece of property. Is that correct? There's... Okay, that's a, 
the 4.208 acre? So I, I think to answer your question is, I, I agree with you, Jacob, that the Glenn family didn't ask for all this heartache to be visited on them. But this decision is the problem. The decision purports to make findings about the road and its consistency with the IAMP and county standards with which it isn't in compliance so much so that Morrow County understood it to approve the road and asked for conditions on the road, right? So the decision brings that up. And then the decision talks about the UEC option as if it is relevant. And if it's relevant, it's relevant because UEC is fixing to put in its transmission towers and lines on that property without even bothering to come to you on the idea that we went through in this first thing that gee whiz, we can just put these things anywhere we want in the city. And so if if where you're going with this is to say, geez, you know, let, let the Glens be out of this. And if you just were to approve their um, partition, but to make very clear in your findings that you were not approving the road, you were not making any findings about the road because there's no application in front of you. And similarly, you're not approving yeah. or making findings about the UEC easement. I think you, you could approve these guys, except you got to give me my seven days. I have that as a matter of right to respond to what was said, but then you could, you know, approve, approve their partition because Nobody really cares about that. I mean, who cares? I mean, other than to support the Glens in, in doing what they want to do with their own property. So another question I've got is out of compliance with the IAMP, is there dimensions in the IAMP that shows right where that road goes or is it basically just a generic line on a map? So is there any proof that says it is not in compliance with the IMP and I, yes. I yes. have to. So the IMP says that the road will not be in the BPA easement and that's because if there's a road in the BPA easement it requires a conditional use permit and the IMP says that the road will be a collector and the city's TSP and its road standards and its code specify what a collector is supposed to be both in terms of width and all the goodies that go with it, you know, the bike paths and the sidewalks and the landscaping and the planter strips and the street lights. And none of that's, uh, none of that's, none of that's even contemplated in this idea that the, the road is being approved when there's no application and being said to be conditioned, consistent with the IMP when it's just not. So Barry, we did see a letter from, um, I'm sorry if I'm hogging the stage. If somebody else has a question, please speak up. Um, I did see a letter from the county, which is a, another participant in the IMP, which looked to, let me see here. So this is from Tamara Mabbitt from the county. We know that this proposed roadway is in a location that is recommended in the interchange area management plan IMP County is a party along with the city and Oregon Department of Transportation to the IMP, and we are in support of the we are in support of the dedication of the roadway as proposed in the land partition application. So the county is in support. Barry, have you had any feedback from ODOT? Is ODOT in support of the proposed location? We didn't get any thought on this. The permit for. Uh, Tying it into the county road is in is in the works. Uh, we also have an application in the Bonneville Power Administration for the uh, routing as close to what it, uh, where it was projected in in the interchange area management. Okay. Those are all my questions. Anybody else have any questions for anybody? Hello. If Wendy gets seven days, I don't want seven days. So, Ed, um, am I hearing that? Am I hearing it that 
you would like seven days in addition to Wendy's seven days to respond to any um, comments in the seven days is what you're asking for? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I'm not an attorney here. So when do you tell me, is that, is that an acceptable timeline, an additional seven days on top of the seven days for response? Yep. Yeah. So the way that would work and Dave can chime in, but, um, actually anybody can talk about the hearing in the first seven days. And then the second one would be limited to rebutting whatever probably we put in the record in the first. So that's fine. I would agree with Wendy. In fact, it, it does say in the code that any participant may request to have yeah. the record left open. Okay. And, and Dave, um, with this initial seven, the second seven, is there any obligation to allow for an additional seven for the final um, as seen in the last application? Or is that just, I mean, per um, request or how does that work? Let me look here. I believe that's per request. That's right. Okay. All righty. All right, thank you. Um, do we have any public agencies? Uh, none of them. We didn't have any public agencies that contacted us, no. Besides Tam or Mabbis comments? The county. Okay. Any, any need for rebuttal evidence? I think we've already went through that. Um, at this point in time, I'll close the hearing um, and deliberation by council. Any comments? Um, obviously, we've got a request, um, which seems uh, beneficial to both sides for seven days to respond um, from the um, proponent and an additional seven days from the opponent to respond after that. Any other any other questions, comments, or deliberation items before we leave the record open and move to the next meeting? All right, Jacob, I'm sorry, this is Zach. Are you are you speaking to the, the commission right now or you did close the meeting? It was I, a little choppy. I did. I did close okay. the hearing, Zach. Yes. All right. Yeah. So yeah, uh, my personal take is that, I mean, while I don't see a, a problem per se with the um, the proposal itself, there are a lot of numerous lines drawn between this and the previous. Uh, oh, really? Uh, Is he clean? Item. And uh, yeah, I, I think it would be absolutely prudent for us to uh, keep the record open. And I, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with keeping the record open for the same length of time. Uh, I know it was not requested specifically, uh, okay. but one does seem determinant on the other, uh, at least some of the same similar uh, items uh, as noted by the proponent and opponent. Uh, so I, 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 I would support any motion, uh, but I, I think we could keep the record open for the, the same length of time. Is there a 120 day that needs to be waived here too? And if so, who's waiving it? Mr. Glenn's the applicant and he's requested to keep the record open. So it's considered extended under the code. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess my, my comments, um, is on the warranted time, I guess I don't really care about the last seven days, as long as we meet the obligation and the request from the applicant and the opponent. Um, 
for the seven and seven without the last seven um because there isn't a need for well um it wasn't requested so i i i don't know if we need to provide that my my last you know my last question here is if we do 17 14 days um would this be an agenda item on our next planning commission general uh um, meeting Barry or are we ha having to set up special meetings for these and if that's the case then it would make sense to throw them on the same night but if we're not and it's going to hit the reoccurring regular meeting time then I don't think it really matters the, the, the next planning commission meeting is basically a week from tonight so it wouldn't meet that 7-7 seven, seven. that would take us uh up to say the 30th of this okay. month. I was just doing accounting for another project today. And if I notice tomorrow, then I meet the 30th. And so that's one of the things that I'm going to be looking at doing this is, and, and this fits right in with what that 21 days uh, looks like. I have a question. So after the 21 days for the first appeal, do we have to meet right after that? Or can it be at our next regular scheduled meeting before the decision is made? I think you need to be mindful of the 120 days and, and the impact of the 21 day extension in, in setting your meeting. So we're talking a special meeting anyway, so it would make sense to put both of these at the 21 day mark to hear them both of the, or to uh, decide both of them at the same time. Okay. Instead of doing two special meetings. So I'm just, I'm just looking at, at the dates here. Is it 21 days starting tomorrow, 21 days starting tonight? Are we gonna set a special meeting on the 29th? Are we looking at the sixth, or you want to keep it on Wednesdays, or do we even need it to, to decide on a date tonight? In, in order for us to get it, to, I've got one other variance request that needs to be dealt with, and it has it, what I, in order to get it published in the paper, it won't be published even if I had it written tonight. It won't be published until um, Saturday because of the way the paper works. Mm -hmm. And that would make it the 30th instead of the 29th. Okay. So we moving back to the deliberation, I think we've got enough on dates. Um, do, do I have a motion? Is there anybody that wants to make a motion on, on tonight? I believe it had would have something to do with um, leaving the record open for a duration of, of a minimum of 14 days, seven days for responding comments and additional seven for additional responding comments from those responding comments. Jacob, this is Sam. Hey. Okay. Hey, I'll, uh, I'll make that motion. Uh, just to clarify, Sam, you're making a motion to leave the record open for the on a, appeal hearing partition 5 2021, the Glen partition part, uh, property partition for a minimum of, of um, two, occur, two um, cycles of seven days, so a total of 14 days. Yes, sir. Okay, do we have a second? Yeah, I'll second that motion. Second. Mr. second. Okay. We have a motion Sorry. from Sam Irons, a second from Zach Reese to leave the record open in the appeal hearing partition 5 2021 Glenn um, property partition um, for um, 14 days. Um, and we will hear um, um, for decision to be made on a special meeting on. Gosh, I don't know. Is that going to put you into the week of the fourth, Barry? 
Oh, it'll it be, it be the night of the uh, uh, September 30th. No, it wouldn't. It did. Prince, I on September 30th. Yeah. Yeah. It's 20 days. The 30th would be 20 days. From the 11th. From the 11th. From the 11th to here is seven days. And from here, it's 14 days. 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. 2021, 22, 23. So that puts us at the first. So if I just say the week of the fourth, okay, does that work? Okay. 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 Well, how about if we just tell you what the date will be? Well, I think we can move forward with approval or um, voting on the motion with a date to be specified after the 21 and the 14 days. We'll put them all on the same night. So, um, Jackie, can we do, or Jen, can we do a roll call vote, please? Yes. Uh, Sam Irons. Sam Irons. I think I have to speak up. Okay, I'm gonna do the roll call. Sam Irons. I, I think Sam dropped off. Oh, no, there he is. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Hi. Okay, sorry. Carla Jimenez. Hi. Jennifer Lighton. Hi. Zach Gracie. Aye. Uh, Ragna Janike. Aye. And Jacob Kane. Aye. All right, that's a unanimous vote. The motion carries unanimously. So, Barry, let us know on the date. Sounds like we'll have three agenda items for a special meeting um, that'll accommodate both to tonight's public hearings as well as your variance request. Okay. Um, moving back into the agenda. Oh, correspondence information, we went through all that stuff. Um, discussion items, I don't have any, unless Barry, you have any additional items. Oh. Okay, so at this point, he didn't want us. What's that? I figured this was going to be a long enough meeting with just the two items. Yeah, I, I agree. So at this point in time, I'll go ahead and adjourn the meeting. Thanks, guys. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Thank you.